This video is about Abraham Ortelius's philosophical worldview and the Stoic quotes on his world map, the Typus Orbis Terrarum. It is a video about the social, philosophical, and historical context that is often overlooked. It's also a video about a single map and its variations. Context is important for understanding history and to understand Ortelius's Typus Orbis Terrarum, the map really needs to be placed within the context of historical events and 16th century antiquarian humanist culture. Perhaps it's just a byproduct of personal years studying philosophy and specifically studying Nietzsche, but in my opinion, uh, maps are never purely about geography. Um, there is always a political or religious undertone uh, or some other identifiable mental schema that underlines a map. Uh, this is a video about Ortelius, uh, his world map and the worldview that permeates from that map. I hope you enjoy the video. The title Typus Orbis Terrarum means, in a very literal sense, uh, image of the orb or sphere of lands. Conventionally, this is translated simply as image of the world. The typus is the first map within Ortelius's Teatrum Orbis Terrarum, or theater of the world. The Teatrum, first published in 1570, is a unique book, uh, widely considered to be the first conventional atlas. And despite being the most expensive book printed at the time, it was a commercial success that brought Ortelius wealth and wide recognition. The Teatrum success means that the typus and its philosophical message was widely disseminated throughout Europe in the late 16th century and early 17th century. As every other map within the Teatrum deals with countries and regions, the typus as a world map at the forefront of, of the book really sets the stage or theater and the philosophical perspective for every other map within the atlas. Ortelius was born in 1527 and died in 1598. Although he traveled widely, Ortelius lived most of his life within the city of Antwerp. Today, Antwerp is a city in Belgium, but in the 16th century, the region that we now consider the Netherlands, Luxembourg, uh, and Belgium was collectively known as the Low Countries. So although the Theatrum is renowned for its place in the history of cartography, Ortelius specifically designed the book to facilitate the study of history. Ortelius was first and foremost a humanist and someone who was passionate about the ancient world. Ortelius's audience was also largely composed of highly educated humanists, and this is especially the case for Ortelius's later publications, where he really kind of zeroes in on the ancient world and on ancient writings. Ortelius was a friend of the great cartographer Mercator, but for the most part, his social circle was composed of historians, artists, poets, and others who were intensely passionate about the study of antiquity. So let's uh, quickly look at some of the uh, geographical features of Ortelius' map, and then briefly review examples of other contemporary maps that are also called Typus Orbis Terrarum. Uh, so this version of Ortelius' Typus is from the Osher Map Library at the University of Southern Maine, and it dates from 1572. Like all historical maps, it is a snapshot preserved in time that demonstrates the geographical and cartographic knowledge of a specific moment. In broad general terms, the features of the map are a strange mix of known geography and speculation. You have America, um, or New India as it's labeled here, and a small blurb about it being discovered in 1492 by Christopher Columbus. There are established features like New France, but also elements that are complete conjecture like the Northwest and Northeast passages. So 
Early versions of the typus have a distinctive bulge extending out from the Pacific coast of South America. Uh, that's a feature that is corrected in the mid-1580s. Uh, along the bottom of the map, you have a bold statement of Terra Australis Numdum Cognita. Uh, the word Australis is a Latin adjective for southern, and this phrase means that the southern land is not yet known or explored. This type of phrase is, is fairly common on uh, early historical maps. So I want to focus your attention on two details that are important for this video. Uh, the first is that the engraver on this version of the typus is listed as Franz Hogenberg. Um, you can see that along the bottom of the map. And Hogenberg will be instrumental in discussing the historical context of the map. The second feature to note is the prominent quote by Cicero along the bottom of the map. It's a fairly bold statement, and it takes up you know, a significant portion of the surface of, of the map. And with one minor exception, this quote accompanies every version of Ortelius's typus, and it tells us a lot about Ortelius's worldview. So there are other maps that are called typus orbis terrarum um, after Ortelius. And Mercator had his own version of a typus. This example was printed in 1632. Um, the cartographer Honduas also had a version of a typus. This example was printed in 1628. These are both posthumously printed maps. They, they both died before those dates. Um, this is a version of a typus by Lambert um, from 1598. And this example actually retains the same quote by Cicero present on Ortelius's map. Uh, in general, when we're looking at Ortelius's typus, there are three different variations. The first accompanied editions of the Teatrum from 1570 to those printed in the mid-1580s. At that point, the map undergoes a few corrections. That's relatively considered kind of a second edition. And then a new version appeared in 1589 that would accompany every subsequent edition of the Teatrum. So let's quickly look at a few of these just to see that type of transition. Uh, we've already looked at a version of Ortelius's typus from 1572. Uh, but this version is from 1574, and you can see clearly that in you know relatively short span of two years, nothing has changed. Um, likewise, the same could be said here. This is a version from 1575, and uh, this version uh, on display is from 1587. This is one of the kind of rare second editions of the map. There are a few corrections, um, but very little, you know, visually it looks almost identical. Uh, by the 1590s, a new version was printed as demonstrated by this map from 1595. And I'll show you another example, this time the same map uh, from 1598. So, you know, there are some variations here in terms of the coloring, things like that. That's Those are somewhat you know, hard to identify simply because the coloring of maps is a, a kind of a, a hand-colored uh, art. So, you know, that's almost natural to have maybe slightly different colorations, but the physical features of the map are identical. So, these later versions are much more embellished and decorated, and they feature four additional quotes from antiquity. So although this version of the map is included in every subsequent edition of the Teatrum, there is an exception. Uh, this version of Artelius's typus is also from 1595, uh, but it, it is included within Ortelius's epitome, which is a pocket-sized, travel-friendly version of the Teatrum as a map that is smaller in scale and designed purely for utility, it does not include any of the ancient quotes. To 
understand the quotes on Ortelius's maps, we need to briefly establish the historical context and acknowledge the Dutch Revolt, or Eighty Years' War, that occurred in the Low Countries between 1568 and 1648. Uh, this is a period that corresponds you know, to the pre-production stage of the Teatrum until well after Ortelius' death. Uh, the Eighty Years' War is complicated, and it is messy. The Low Countries were controlled by Catholic Spain, but they were also heavily influenced by the ideals of the Protestant Reformation and the neighboring German states. So within this relatively small uh, you know, geographical region, there is both a yearning for political freedom and regional self-determination, but also a period of inquisition, religious conflict, and persecution on both sides. Territory and cities within the Low Countries were exchanged numerous times, but eventually you have the de facto independence of the north, while the southern low countries remained under traditional control. So important for our consideration, there were several so-called Spanish Furies, where Spanish soldiers mutinied or were otherwise given license to sack a city. As I previously pointed out, Franz Hogenberg engraved Ortelius's maps, but he also engraved depictions of the massacres and other related events of his time. So to provide a little more context, I'll quickly list a few of the more atrocious events of the conflict uh, that occurred during Ortelius' lifetime. Um, the religious intolerance began before armed conflict, and in 1556 there was a series of iconoclastic riots within Antwerp, um, that Ortelius witnessed firsthand. This is an engraving by Hogenberg that shows the resident Protestants pulling down and otherwise defacing the Catholic statues. In 1572, two years after the publication of the Teatrum, uh, the inhabitants of the northern cities of Zutphen and Narden were massacred. Uh, this is an engraving, um, I think, from the 17th century by J. Lucan. Also, in 1572, there was a so-called Spanish Fury at Mechelen, a city only a few miles from Antwerp and the hometown of Hogenberg. This is where he was born. And uh, this is another of his engravings. Mechelen was sacked and pillaged for three days by the Spanish and suffered the same fate again in 1580, uh, this time by an army of English mercenaries fighting for the Calvinists. In 1575, the city of Udwater was captured by the Spanish, and its inhabitants were massacred. And this is another of Hogenberg's engravings. In 1576, the city of Maastricht was pillaged, and the city was sacked a second time by the Spanish in 1579. You might recall that Ortelius lived uh, throughout his life in Antwerp. And in 1576, mutinous Spanish soldiers sacked the city for three days. This is another engraving by Hogenberg, uh, this time depicting a massacre in the great market square of the city. Uh, that building still stands today, so here's a contemporary photo of the building and the square where the events occurred. So in the aftermath of 1576, when the Spanish sacked the city, the Calvinists kind of retook the city and maintained Protestant control until the Spanish once again took the city in 1585, following a year-long siege. Uh, thereafter, the city remained in Spanish control, and Protestant residents were given a period of time, you know, it's I think it's uh, two to four years, something like that, to vacate the city. Um, some Protestants recanted and reverted to Roman Catholicism, but many opted to re relocate north. And, you know, Antwerp was once a center of trade and industry, um, and it had access to the North Sea, uh, but the Dutch forces blockaded that river access until 1795, so over 200 years um, the, the blockade was maintained. And, you know, these types of 
climatic events meant that Antwerp's population population plummeted from you know roughly a hundred thousand down to about forty thousand um, as people left the city, uh, both for religious and commercial reasons. And the cultural center of the Low Countries transitioned at this time from Antwerp in the south to Amsterdam in the north. So, you know, the, I think the important consideration here is, you know, the Low Countries is not a large geographical region. And during the late 16th century, its inhabitants, including Ortelius, are witnessing immense violence and religious intolerance. It is amazing, but uh, that is the backdrop of Ortelius's published works. The 14th century scholar and poet Petrarch was among the earliest and most pivotal of humanists, and I was recently reading his autobiographical letter entitled To Posterity, and I was struck by this passage. Among my many activities, I devoted myself particularly to the study of antiquity, since I always disliked the age in which I lived. When Artilius witnessed the iconoclastic riots within Antwerp, he wrote to a friend that they are living in a sick age that is threatened by so many illnesses. These are both powerful rejections of their own time, and in my opinion, many humanists used their passion for the ancient world as a form of escapism. It is a method to develop a common bond that transcends borders and local culture in shared appreciation of the past. And in an age of inquisition and religious intolerance, studying past cultures, writings, and philosophy also allowed a humanist like Ortelius to criticize current events in a manner that was not overtly political or religious, and in that sense, it is a manner that was a little more benign and a little less dangerous. So there are two quotes by Seneca that we'll examine, and those are on later versions of Ortelius's typus. And in a private letter, um, he admits that, he, uh, that Ortelius made Seneca his idol. But he then kind of hedges the bet by stating that he first devotes himself to sacred literature. It is worth noting that Hogenberg, who made all those engravings I've showed, uh, would be banished from Antwerp. And in 1544, Mercator had been jailed for suspected heresy, in part because he was traveling widely and had a, a wide kind of social circle. These were dangerous times, and Ortelius walked a fine line. Publicly, Ortelius is a devout Catholic. And in 1575, he was appointed geographer to the king of Spain. And yet, many of his closest friends and even members of his family were Protestant. And so it's not surprising that Ortelius would seek solace in the ancient world and find comfort in Stoicism. Justus Lipsius was a close friend of Ortelius. And in 1583, he published a work called a de a Constantia in Publicis Malus. Um, a blunt translation would basically be resilience in times of public evil. Uh, this was a popular book among the humanists of Antwerp, and it promoted a form of neo-Stoicism that was compatible with Christian theology. It was also worth noting that the Roman Stoics, quoted by Artelius on his typus, were considered proto-Christian saints in the eyes of early humanists. So, very briefly, um, Stoicism was a branch of Greek philosophy that teaches that happiness is achieved by accepting the moment, by not allowing oneself to be controlled by the a desire for pleasure or fear of pain, and by understanding the world. There is a sense here that someone who is Stoic is indifferent to pain or grief, but it is more about acknowledging and accepting that pain and grief are always a possibility. And by doing so, you thereby understand that the blessings of life are even more dear. Uh, there are strong themes of friendship and human solidarity, 
And it is worth noting that humanists of Europe had shared interests that crossed borders and a universal language in the form of Latin. So that they really almost share those values in common. So Stoicism also places emphasis on the pursuit of knowledge and learning alongside calls for humility and acknowledging how much one does not understand. It was common at the time to have a distinguishing motto, and Ortelius adopted two that were stoical in nature. So the first is an excerpt in Greek, Moria para todeo, uh, that you can see here on the frontispiece of Ortelius's Paragon. The Paragon is something that I've devoted a lot of time to studying in recent years. Um, it's uh, Ortelius's historical atlas of the ancient world. And uh, this, uh, this motto was also printed on a commemorative coin. Um, in general terms, it is an adaptation from St. Paul's uh, first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 19. Uh, it is conventionally translated as foolishness in the eyes of God, uh, but that seems you know, rather harsh to me. Um, it's been a while since I was taught Greek, but Moriar... Uh, is you know basically means like a small piece or part um and in a direct sense i think a you know, more appropriate translation might be small or insignificant compared to god uh, as we will see there are parallels in meaning between that type of phrase and the quote by cicero on his typus a second motto was adopted later in life uh, and that was contemno et orno menti manu, which translates as, I defy and decorate with mind and hand. The meaning here is essentially that Ortelius's mind stood above the daily strife and trials that were engulfing the low countries and the wider world, while at the same time his hand beautified the world through his craft. A lot more could be said about these subjects. These are, you know, incredibly complex. But the important consideration is that both contemporary historical events and the philosophical response are essential to fully understanding the meaning of Ortelius's typus and its quotes from antiquity. So with that context in place, let us now examine Ortelius's worldview as it is expressed on this map. Except for the epitome, every version of the typus has this central quote, quid e potes, weirdere magnum in ribus humanus, qui eternitas omnus totiesqui munda notus sit magnitudo. This translates as, what can possibly seem great in human affairs to him for whom all eternity and the magnitude of the entire world are known. This quote is by the Roman statesman Marcus Tullius Cicero, uh, who was born in 106 and died in 43 BCE. Uh, Cicero is an important figure in the late Roman Republic, and the rediscovery of his writings basically kick-started the European Renaissance. So next to the Gutenberg Bible, works of Cicero were among the first to be printed, and it is highly likely that any contemporary who viewed Ortelius's map would have recognized Cicero's quote and its context. So this quote is an adapted excerpt from Cicero's Tusculan Disputations. The Disputations were written in about 45 BCE, following the death of Cicero's daughter. Uh, and he kind of, in, in grief, he went into, into the countryside and wrote a series of, of books. And it is a work of Stoicism consisting of five books on five themes. The first book deals with the contempt of death, the second on pain, the third on grief, the fourth on mental anguish, and the fifth on whether virtue alone is, a, is enough for a happy life. So this specific excerpt that Ortelius is using is from Book 4, Section 17 of Cicero's work. And expanding upon that specific passage, 
Here is the quote within the larger context of Cicero's text. Whoever through moderation and constancy is at rest in his mind and in calm possession of himself, so as to not fixate on problems, nor be defeated by fear, nor burn with a frivolous desire, nor relax by extravagant joy, such a man is the same wise man whom we are, are inquiring for. He is the happy man to whom nothing in this life seems intolerable enough to depress him, and nothing is exquisite enough to carry him away. And here is Ortelius's quote. For what is there in this life that can appear great to him who has acquainted himself with eternity and the utmost extent of the universe? For what is there in human knowledge, or this short life, that can appear great to the wise man whose mind is always on guard, so that nothing occurs which is unforeseen, unexpected, or entirely new? The wise man surveys all sides and always knows the proper place to live free from all the troubles and distresses of life and calmly bears every misfortune. Free from grief and every other mental anguish, he is completely happy, whereas a distorted, a disordered mind, separated from reason, loses both sanity and health. So, essentially, the quote represents a shared acknowledgement of the limitations of knowledge, and it presents a shared worldly perspective. Ortelius is promoting a common worldview among humanists of his time, and uh, this type of quote acts as a rallying cry for a solidarity, tolerance, and humility. It is both an acknowledgement of the limits of geographical knowledge and a call for resilience and proper perspective in the face of contemporary events. In the 1960s, uh, the first images of the Earth from the surface of the Moon initiated an era of international cooperation, fostered kind of a sense of shared humanity by making it you know, really apparent that we all live on one planet. And those photos kind of demonstrated that we inhabited, you know, just in an absolutely small speck in the depths of space. And for many people, those images created that sense of shared humanity. It was American astronauts on the moon, but it was a human achievement. They showed that our day-to-day -day perspective is insignificant and that our prior priorities are wrong and that our international conflicts are misguided. Basically, Ortelius's typus and its central Stoic quote was trying to achieve that same sense about four centuries ago. By the 1590s, armed conflict had raged for decades. Ortelius's friends and family had suffered, Antwerp had been repeatedly attacked, and the Low Countries had been split. So with that backdrop, the third version of the typus is printed, and Ortelius's central message is reinforced with four additional quotes. The quote in the top left reads, Homnes hac legi sunt generati qui terrenter illum globum quem in hoc templo medium viris qui terra dicitur. This translates as men were appointed existence so that you can examine the globe that is called earth, which you see here for open display. Now, my translation used is a little bit of creative license because the, the, the quote actually refers to a temple. Um, when you isolate the quote like this, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, within the context of the wider text that Ortelius is using, it makes a little more, a little more sense to use that type of language. Like the first quote, this second quote is also attributed to Cicero. This excerpt is an adaptation from Book 6 of Cicero's De Re Publica, a political dialogue where Scipio Emilianus, who is the, the great Roman statesman in general, uh, is portrayed as a wise man. Scipio is a conflicted character in Roman history. 
And for the purposes of understanding Ortelius's excerpt in, in context, Scipio is responsible for destroying the city of Carthage in the Third Punic War. And as the story goes, uh, as the city burned, Scipio is said to have wept openly for his enemies, as he realized that all cities and nations will likewise one day meet the same fate. Uh, basically, that every empire that preceded Rome had once been great before falling into ruin. And, you know, uh, the historian uh, Polybius, who was a close uh, associate of Scipio, asked Scipio really what he meant by that. And uh, Scipio confessed that he feared that Rome itself would likewise one day burn. Um, this is an acknowledgement of the fate of all things human. And Ortelius's excerpt is from section 15 of the sixth book of A De Re Publica. And that book is called The Dream of Scipio. And in this dialogue, uh, a younger Scipio is led by his adopted ancestor, a Scipio Africanus, up into the heavens. And so they're, you know, in basically orbit <laughs> for all intents and purposes, and they're surrounded by the stars. And looking back down upon the earth, Scipio is told that he will one day destroy Carthage. And from that high perspective, Scipio notices that uh, Rome appears insignificant. Uh, Ortelius's quote in context begins in Scipio's voice, and he has just caught sight of his deceased biological father, Lucius Aemilius Paulus. Um, and I'll read. As soon as I saw him, my eyes burst out into tears, but he took me into his arms, embraced me, and told me not to cry. When my tears had been repressed, and I regained the ability to speak, I addressed my father. Best and most venerable of parents, since Africanus has said that this is the only life why do I linger here? Why should I not come to where you are? That, he replied, is impossible, for you cannot enter this place unless the God, whose temple is all that you see, frees you from your body. And here's the quote from the map. For men are born on this condition, that they should be faithful guardians of that globe, which is situated within this temple and is called Earth. Uh, that is an interesting quote to adorn a map. Uh, like Scipio and Paulus, uh, by observing this map uh, from above, uh, as though we were in orbit, essentially, it is as though we are looking down at the earth from the heavens. And within the larger context of the dream of Scipio, Scipio's observation that important cities and countries now seem insignificant is a political statement that connects to the humble perspective expressed by the previous quote. Um, Scipio's own re realization as he watched Carthage burn that the same fate would happen to Rome is fascinating because at that precise point uh, in Roman power, this is uh, in 146 BCE, Roman dominance seemed secure and was destined to only increase. Of course, from a historical perspective, we know that the Roman Empire would eventually fall, especially the, the western half, and Rome would be sacked repeatedly. And closer to Ortelius' own time, uh, Rome was brutally sacked in 1527. So humanists were fascinated by the study of antiquity, but they understood the reality of historical change, and they could see that transition occurring in their own time. So Paulus's comment to his son, which is displayed on Ortelius' map, that we should persist and persevere through life and preserve the earth, are powerful stoke sentiments that reinforce a shared sense of humanity and a shared planet. In the top right, you'll see another quote by Cicero, uh, and this reads, Equus vi hendi casa arande bos, vi anandi et a custodiendi canis homo at autum ortus ad mundum contemplendum. Uh, this translates as the horse was born to carry, 
the ox to plow, the dog to protect and hunt. Man, however, was born to contemplate the earth. This quote is likewise attributed to Cicero. It is an adaptation from De Natura Deorum, or On the Nature of the Gods, that, like the Tusculan Disputations, was written following the death of Cicero's daughter. It is another influential dialogue, divided into three books and three speakers, each arguing for a different school of Greek philosophy. This excerpt is from Book 2, Section 37, and unsurprisingly, at this point, the second book argues for Stoic philosophy. Ortelius's quote in context begins within Cicero's text as, Just as the cover was created for the, for the shield, the sheath for, for the sword, so everything else, with the exception of the world, was created for the sake of something else. The crops and fruits, for instance, which the earth produces for the sake of animals, and animals for the sake of men. And here begins Artelius's quote. As the horse for riding, the ox for plowing, and the dog for hunting and keeping watch. Man himself, however, was born for the purpose of contemplating and imitating the world. He is by no means perfect, but he is a small f fragment of that which is perfect. So this quote is about the proper conduct of men and the type of actions that they are created to perform. Uh, according to the speaker, we should be obs we should be contemplating and imitating um, the world. And the quote, therefore, is an affirmation of the observer. Essentially, by you know, looking at the map, we are demonstrating the proper qualities of humanity. Although it is not included uh, within Artelius' excerpt, the portion following that, that piece of Latin kind of discusses the imperfect nature of being but one part of a larger whole. And I think this also contributes to the ongoing themes of, hum of um, humility and shared humanity, and also the sentiment of Ortelius' first motto. The quote in the bottom left of the map reads, Hoc est punctum, quod inter tot gentis, ferro et igni divideter, o quam ridiculi sunt mortalium termini. This translates as, Earth is only a pinprick, divided into many nations by sword and fire or destruction. Oh, how ridiculous the boundaries of humans are. This excerpt is attributed to Lucius um, Aeneas Seneca, uh, who was born in about roughly 4 BCE and died in 65 CE or AD. Um, he lived a complicated life, uh, but it is generally known to posterity um, mostly as a Roman a Stoic, uh, but also importantly as an advisor to the Emperor Nero. Um, as I referenced earlier, Ortelius placed Seneca as kind of his personal idol, and uh, his friend uh, Justus Lipsius also was highly influenced by the writings of Seneca. So this quote is adapted from section 8 and 9 of the preface to Seneca's Naturales Questiones, uh, which means basically natural questions. It is a book that explores the natural world and discusses things like um, uh, uh, meteors, rainbows, thunder, lightning, water, hail, snow, earthquakes, comets, uh, basically you name it, uh, together and alongside stoic moralizing episodes. Uh, there's a real sense within the natural questions that the book is contemplating nature and uh, that by doing so, you kind of free the mind, develop a greater consciousness, and elevate one's moral uh, center. So the meaning of the quote on the map is blunt. Uh, it doesn't need a lot of interpretation. But it is still interesting to look at the larger context of, this, of the text in Seneca's own words. 
So in the preface, uh, Seneca is imagining looking down upon the earth from an elevated height. And he describes the geographical features that form the political boundaries of the ancient world. So here in is Ortelius's quote in context. From above, one can look down upon this world, covered for the most part by sea, large areas are either desert or frozen. And here's the quote from the map. The philosopher says to himself, is this the world that so many tribes divide by fire and sword? How ludicrous are their boundaries. The Dacian must not pass the Danube. The, the, the Struma must separate the Thracians. The Euphrates must obstruct the Parthenons. The Danube must divide the Sarmatian and the Roman. The Rhine sets the limit for Germany. The Pyrenees must rise between the Gallic and Spanish provinces, and between Egypt and Ethiopia, a desert of barren sands. If ants were endowed with human intelligence, would they not in a similar manner divide the floor into many provinces? But when you elevate what is truly great, then when you see army, armies marching forth with floating banners and organized as if by some great design, you will pleasantly remark, a dark column goes through the fields. Those are but ants running about in narrow work. Apart from the measure of our bodies, what is there between us and them? It is a mere point on which you navigate, wage war, and conquer. Your kingdoms are trivial even when they stretch from ocean to ocean. And in the following sections of Seneca's work, he argues that taking that higher perspective nourishes and grows the soul. Uh, the reference to the dark column going through the fields is um, to Book 4, line about 403 of the Aeneid, where uh, Virgil uses a similar analogy to describe the Trojans working as a unit to prepare their ships. Um, by adding this quote to the map, Ortelius is encouraging the viewer to recognize and adopt the higher perspective. Alluding to the text, emphasis is placed on a genuine typus, right, an, an authentic image, rather than an artificially constructed map. We are the philosopher, and we ourselves are observing the map, and we can recognize that everything is much smaller, and that regions are listed, but not countries. So clearly the message here is that war, conflict, and borders are trivial. In the context where the low countries are now divided uh, through conflict along arbitrary political and religious lines, it is a powerful political and religious statement about the futility of war and religious conflict. The last of Ortelius's quotes in the bottom right reads, Utinem Hakwe Mad modum universa mundi faces in conspectum venet itia philo philosophia tota nobis posset ocerere. Um, it translates as, Would that all wisdom were able to offer itself to us, just as the entire shape of the world comes into our view. This is another quote from Seneca, this time adapted from the 89th letter within the Epistulae Morales ad Lucilium, uh, or Moral Letters to Lucilius. Uh, and this letter in particular deals with the different parts of philosophy, and Seneca's letters in general have strong Stoic themes related to the contempt of death, personal resilience, and uh, they really kind of highlight kind of virtue as the supreme good. So the quote in context within Seneca's larger letter is such. It is a useful fact that you wish to know, one which is essential to him who pursues wisdom, namely the parts of philosophy and the division of its whole into separate components. For by studying the parts, we can be brought more easily to understand the whole. And here's the quote from Ortelius's map. 
I only wish that philosophy might come before our eyes in all her, her unity, just as the whole expanse of the firmament is spread out for us to gaze upon. It would be a sight closely resembling that of the firmament, for then surely philosophy would captivate all mortals with love for her, and we, we would abandon all those things in our ignorance we thought were great. However, as this, this cannot fail to be our fate, we must view philosophy just as men gaze upon the secrets of the firmament. And so, you know, what is very apparent here is that this quote really speaks to the yearning of universal knowledge that Ortelius and many humanists were seeking. It is a quote about wonder and accepting the limits of human knowledge. It is a lesson uh, that, that I've certainly learned in making this video, and uh, by now that should be recognized as a common theme on Ortelius's map. Um, this might be pushing the metaphor a bit, but it is interesting to consider the discussion of studying parts to understand the whole as it relates to Ortelius's Theatrum. Uh, the Theatrum begins with an image of the whole world, and it really speaks speaks to the message of this quote by showing us the entire expanse. It is the totality of contemporary geographical knowledge, and thereafter the Theatrum transitions into more in-depth knowledge of each specific region or part of the world. The typist then is basically a lure, right, that should captivate the observer and provide them with the correct perspective before transitioning into the small details to provide kind of the, the more comprehensive understanding. So there you have it. Uh, looking at each of these quotes through the historical and philosophical context really provides a fresh perspective of this map and its place at the forefront of the Theatrum. Ortelius' own motto, contemno et orno menti manu, uh, which I discussed earlier, reflects Ortelius's preferences to stoically abstain from being involved in the contemporary political and religious conflicts that were embroiling Europe. Uh, therefore, the Typus Orbis Terrarum and its quotes by ancient Stoics should be considered kind of a proclamation and demonstration of Ortelius's worldview and his intellectual values uh, during this type of religious conflict. And this is a worldview that was present in 1570 when the Theatrum was first published. And it is a worldview that Ortelius reinforced over the next three decades as the Low Countries split and conflict continued. Ortelius's Typus Orbis Terrarum is a map of defiance. It is a map of resilience. And it is a map of humility. And it is a map that expresses a truly global perspective with a religious, political, and philosophical message. Uh, thank you for watching the video, and I hope you enjoyed.